things really started to come to an end. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with the culture wars that developed out of uh, the 1968 presidential campaign. Mm. Uh, that was a very chaotic time. Uh, you know, there was Bobby Kennedy who got assassinated. There was uh, Everybody. <laughs> MLK who got Everybody assassinated. Got killed. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. And Cointel like, pro that's a discussion for another time though. <laughs> What, so what what Nixon does is he comes in with this campaign, um, you know, focused on it's called the Southern Strategy. I'm sure you've heard of it. I'm sure lots of people have. Yeah. Uh, well, this Southern Strategy was about dividing people on cultural issues as opposed to class based ones. Oh. And it was very effective. Yes. Um, you know, we talk about like the racist like aspects of it, like the tough on crime stuff, school busing, and the war on drugs, but like things like abortion. Uh, became big issues because Damn, as part of this like shift um, uh, uh, as part of the shift, they built bridges between like corporatists ideal uh, ideal ideology and um, uh, uh, religious extremism, which is why you can see things like, uh, you know, big business men supporting, um, uh, you know, like the, the religious, aspects of the right and and right. vice versa that that tie between corporatism and like evangelicalism and and things of that nature yes exactly you're kind of fucking me up right now with this because like i i've i've always understood that they use these issues for, uh to divide us so that we don't look at each other as working class people being fucked but you know i hate the black guy because he took the job or the mexican guy and etc but I guess I didn't realize that it had this like very uh, deliberate beginning. Yeah. You know, so yeah. Go on. Man, how you been? Uh, it's been a long time since I've since I've seen you. I think it's been God since. Uh, Maybe even when you were running for mayor in like yeah. what twenty sixteen or whatever. Yeah, it's been a, it's been like four years, I think at least. It has, it has. Uh, where are you living now? I think we chatted about this some um, uh, a while back, but I'm talking to so many people all the time, I, f I forget and I feel terrible. And people are like, "Oh, you remember? I, I told you this." I'm like, "Uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay. sorry." I forget where I'm living some days, so it's good. Yeah. Uh, I'm in Ames now. I go to Iowa State. I actually just graduated, uh, so we're uh, we're figuring out what post uh, college life is like. Yeah, what'd you go to school for, man? Uh, history was my major, and then I double minored in social and poli sci. And I'm actually going. I've, I've applied to grad school here at Iowa State to go to uh, the sociology program. Oh, so really? we'll see if I get into that. Yeah, I'm, I love science, dude. Yeah, yeah, dude. Sociology, all, all the social sciences have always fascinated me. And I've always, like, I originally, I got my AA and I wanted to go for history, government, and then um, secondary education in my bachelor's. Just to, I wanted to teach and stuff, but, you know, being a single dad and then having to work and, you know, it took me three years and I was pretty burnt out and it's expensive as, as shit. So I, you know, and then I kind of stumbled into YouTube and I discovered that I wanted to write, you know, so I was like, I'm just going to try to make a career out of this. We'll see where it goes. I think my family was kind of like, dude, no, you want to be, you want to be a writer and a YouTuber? Like you're not. <laughs> so, but that's kind of where it took me, you know? It's kind of like being a teacher in a way though, wouldn't you say? Yeah. But like, at least if I go and I finish my bachelor's, I can probably get a job and like insurance and retirement. That's important. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, you know, like and my, my mom's and my dad are supportive, but I think they're a little bit like, Oh shit. I thought he was gonna like be able to take care of himself for sure. And now they're like, fuck. <laughs> I feel but, but yeah. So what are you trying to do with that degree, man? Uh, well, right now I'm just looking at like grad school because ideally what I want to do is uh, I want to be a professor. I wanted to be a teacher. I was originally yeah. like an ed major when I went to NIAC. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I changed it up when I got here and I, I thought, you know, who, I, if I want to teach, I want to teach and research at the same time because mm -hmm. I like both. Yeah. Uh, so I thought that that would be like the, the perfect career path for me. 
Yeah. Uh, so right now I'm just like looking for just something to do in like the meantime. Mm-hmm. But it's, you know, the job market's not exactly great right now. <laughs> no. no. Is it ever though is a thing? And, no. and, and then during this time period, it's even worse. And it's one of those things where like, you don't think it can get worse, but well, it can, especially with the pandemic and everything economy completely collapsed. So, so yeah, what have you, what have you been doing in the meantime? You said you're kind of looking into, you said you did get accepted at the graduates program or not yet. That, that was like, uh, uh, four days ago is when everything was due. So I should be getting the news like in the next few weeks, but, uh, that's mostly about just what's when just, uh, has been what's eating my time up has been that process. Uh, and obviously I just graduated like last semester. So I'm very new to the being done life. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and how old are you, man? Uh, 23. My birthday was, uh, was 10 days ago now. Yeah. Well, happy birthday, man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So you're still young. You're still kind of in that, like, and I guess, I mean, I am too, uh, degree to a degree i'm only 27 but i kind of know what i want to try to do is but you're still kind of like getting the education and kind of open to like wherever it takes you huh yeah i'm just going wherever life like takes me at this point so you want to teach and you want to do like research and stuff like that like anthropological or, or sociological research oh, things yeah. like that i know you know we interact some on social media and stuff and you, you know you're definitely you know, would be characterized as quote unquote, a leftist. You've done activist work. Um, I can't remember. I think you were involved somewhat with the Prestige fight here in Mason city, weren't you? Or Not like like a ton. I knew about it. Um, I I attended the meetings of like, where do we go from here? Yes. Uh, Which actually that, that developed later, I guess. But like the Prestige, um, I was really I was really young at that point. I was kind of confused. My position kind of like jumped back and forth on yeah, it. Yeah, you were like 19 at the time? Well, I think actually Prestige was when I was 17 or 18. Oh, was it really? Cause, yeah, because Prestige was when I was in like high school still. Like five years, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, really yes. Think about. I know, dude. Well, I think about that sometimes too. Like that that yeah. was other than I, I tried to organize a union at Curry's when I was like 19 or 20, but that, or well, no, I was, yeah, 2021, 20, but that was See, like, I had no idea what I was doing. I just knew that this know, job suck. Did you know Carl from Curry's? Oh yeah. I know Carl. Yeah. yeah. I bet you did. Yeah. I bet yeah. You did. He was great. He was one of my like best buddies in there, man. He's so fucking funny. I worked with him on the line for a little bit when I worked, you worked at Curry's. Curry's too. Just for, uh, Oh God, how long? Like two months, three months, maybe. That's impressive to make it that long, man. <laughs> uh, well, I was just doing temp work over a summer in between Making NIAC some cash. semesters. Yeah. Yeah, it's a hellhole in there, huh, man? Oh, my God, dude. It's it's, it's hot as hell. Oh, yeah, dude. my God. I used to work on this um, robotic uh, weld line uh, in there where it's just, you know, like, you know, gravy frames come out, same stuff. And I, and I used to stack it, and it would be 110, 120 degrees in there. And it got to the point where I got a five gallon bucket and I filled it with water up at the water station and I brought a big like cup in and I would just like scoop it cu- and dump it on me. And I'd be just soaking. I don't blame you, dude. It was hell on earth, man. But yeah, so that was like my, my first time uh, really trying to organize anything and we got pretty far, but they they brought in like professional union breaker and these old boomers. They, they played a... Um, a like propaganda film from the Reagan administration when they were really like going against the airline unions. Yeah. And it was fucking hilarious to me, but these boomers like got afraid and it, it all tanked. And then, you know, they ended up firing me over that. And, but then, yeah, but with the press, it's saying that was like my first real experience, um, trying to organize and, and doing activist work and, uh, for the subscribers, for the viewers who don't know what that was, is in our little town in North Iowa. Well, Iowa has a huge problem with industrial agriculture. We have like three to five million hogs, or some. It's like it's like double the population of Iowa, the amount of hogs we have, and it's just completely devastated our water systems and you know giant agro business taking over, putting small businesses our small farmers out of business. And well, we had this um, Prestige LLC that came into uh, Mason City to try to build a plant in the community. 
a lot of members of the community got organized, tried to stop it, and it was real divisive. We ended up having a city councilman who was like a really promising Democrat. He ended up sh uh, shooting himself over it, and it was a pretty heavy time. But yeah, that um, getting back to kind of where you started that, that was like kind of the fulcrum here that I think that first incident that got a lot of young people um, involved in the political process because then Bernie came about and then like you said you kind of started getting involved in those uh, where do we go from here meetings that came about in the wake of that and and I just I remember when I first met you being like impressed but also like what the fuck that this like 18 year old kid is running for mayor <laughs> it was weird um yeah what possessed you to do that man i mean I, all respect in that i never i don't have a miss uh, councilman john lee? john lee yeah really? so i was i was like job shadowing him uh uh because it was like just after i graduated high school uh and i was in um a class for like job shadowing teachers at nyack and yeah. Uh, he was my assigned teacher because I was like a history and, and government dude. And so like, in, like one of the uh, time periods that I would go into the class, like he just had a free period. So we just chat yeah. and like, it just, uh, first of all, I found out all the memes he likes, uh, but all the what? All the memes he loves. Okay. It was great. Uh, it was during <laughs> the presidential season. So it was, it was fantastic. That but, was about uh, 20, 2015, 2016, wasn't it? 2016. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we just got talking about uh, the the mayoral race that was coming up, hmm. and he was like, "You know, you could do that." And I'm like, "No, no, no, no." And then I'm like, "Yeah, yeah I could, I could actually," because like the the position of mayor isn't like a huge one. the The biggest thing is like that you run the meetings and that you uh, uh, make some appointments. Yeah. Um, but like mo most of the actual like work of the uh, of the city goes through the city administrator, who at the time was. Uh, uh, Mr. Trout, who now actually organizes for Topeka, I think, Kansas. Does he? Yeah, yeah. He oh, he moved out there? Yeah, he did. He did. Mm. Um, this is a big thing for him. Um, and it was pretty cool. He's a, he's a really good city uh, administrator, city manager. Yeah, we had some differences with him, obviously. Yeah, but he, I mean, he was a professional. But a little side note, it, it is, and this isn't to say anything, about, anything bad about Trout, but it, it is interesting and I think perhaps a problem that you know for those in city government and municipal government a lot of times it's not about and you know it's it's probably 50 50 it's not always about being a leader in your community or doing you know what's best for your community and i think most people try to but it's a, it's like a career thing mm -hmm. and i think that was like the the case for uh the mayor at the time book meyer and a lot of times it's just like a job to people and, and it's not about you know, and again, not saying anything bad about Trout, but the fact that he would move there to do the same job, it's like, is it really about, I think the point I'm getting at is like, we need more civic minded people who really care about their community and like plan on spending their lives there to be in charge of municipal government. I think, I think we'd see oh, a lot I, of different situations. I agree 110%. Like you, you have to have uh, people who are invested in the community in order for it to, to grow and to succeed. If you want it to go the direction that it, it, it you want it to go, you're going to put work in to do that. Uh, but if it's like a job, then you're just going to do, I mean, what might yeah. make sense, like cost effective wise or yeah. what might make sense uh, in the short term. Yeah, um, try to do at, like, the long term picture. Exactly. You're not looking at like what what's the needs. Mm -hmm. You know, you're looking at things like, um, you know, what what kind of like business or new jobs can I bring in here, whether they're good for the community or not, that's going to like look good on my resume when I go to a bigger city to try to be an administrator or a bureaucrat there, or, um, you know, like what can I do to bring up, um, you know, mortgage uh, prices or real estate values, you know, thing like you're looking at numbers and you're not looking at like human, uh, you know, interactions in human situations, which is a, a big problem in, in, in government in general, I think, you know, is oh, it goes deep. Line. It yeah. got like, like I actually saw this kind of thing. So I was in student government here at Iowa state and like, it's even like careerist, like at that level. Yeah. Uh, it gets it's like a mindset. Yeah. It's, and like, it just wasn't for, I, that's when I realized I didn't want to be uh, that kind of politician anymore. It was when I was in student government. Uh, Cause like you really see how the, process like 
is and people just get so caught up in like the 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 the, the rules and the mm-hmm. the like parliamentary like bullshit yes. of it all instead and of they, actually they, governing yeah they lose sight of like the mission which the mission is to provide for your constituents to provide for your community to provide mm-hmm. for uh, your environment uh, and it, it just gets lost in in all these like pointless things written by people like 20 years before that don't actually have any merit and that you're going to change or you might ignore in specific instances anyway, if they're particularly inconvenient. Yeah. 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 I think, you know, I've had this con- a similar conversation with uh, both my co-host uh, John boy. And then also my, my, my mom, you know, like Johnny's always, and I still might run for office at some point. I just, it, the, you know, my thought process is I want to get this YouTube off the ground. I want to publish some books, have my income come from there. And, and then, you know, I'm set free from the millstone and I can look at what I can do to make the world a better place in other ways. Right. But I've always had this point of contention from, uh, johnny uh in particular where he's like dude like you should run for office like i'll help you like you could be mayor here you could do this and that and you know getting out of college and doing activist work and and doing this channel i've like realized like that's not what i want to do and 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 like you like you were saying like this isn't for me it's 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 about the seat it's about the rules and like that ain't how shit actually gets done you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And my mom's like, you know, like, you know, her husband's becoming more and more unplugged. and He's becoming more and more of a socialist, but she's, her heart's in the right place, but she's very much a liberal, you know what I'm saying? And, mm-hmm. uh, she's like, you know, you've really lecturing me. She's like, Dilly, you've really, you know, shot yourself in the foot with this whole communist thing. You know, people are, if you, you, you know, you could have ran for office and now pe- people are going to be like, he's a communist and they aren't ready to hear that. And you, and you shouldn't have done that. And now people are going to think you're crazy. And I'm like, well, mom, I've realized like this ain't, this isn't what I want to do. If I get involved politically, it's like, I want to be an activist an organizer. You know, like Malcolm X, H- Huey P. Newton, or like all these people, because in the end, that's how political power is really built. Because again, like you said, the politicians are doing the rules and they're sitting in this administrative seat. But the, the grassroots organizing, the, the unionization, the uh, anarcho-syndicalism is like what puts the pressure on the, uh, the buttons, if you will, of the politicians in order to actually get get st- and then they'll draft the laws according to the pressure because like we ain't going to work we're not doing this we're shutting the street down until you yeah. get this done you know so nothing happens without like mass action and mass action doesn't happen without people who organize that mass action exactly like, yeah absolutely. so i mean yeah you you ran for mayor all these years ago uh like what did you and you know it, you're a young kid or whatever but like what did you take from that and you've talked about, you know, going in, uh, into school now and kind of where, what you'd like to do, you'd like to do research, you'd like to teach. But like, what did you learn from your experience of trying to run for local office? And in the future, once you've had your degrees and you've settled into a job or whatever, do you foresee a future of doing activism, organization, or running for office or anything like that? I definitely do see a future like in, in activism and in uh continuing like political work. I'm part of the IMT right now. Uh, do you know the IMT? What's that? The, that's the International Marxist Tendency. Uh-huh. Uh, they're a Trotskyist organization. Really? Um, yeah. Um, I vibe with them uh, pretty well. They're, they were part of Iowa State like university clubs, which is why I joined initially. You but kind of fell into that. Yeah, but uh, they're good about theory. We read theory. I don't always agree with everything that's like said, obviously, but I haven't found anything that's so disagreeable that I wouldn't like mm-hmm. be a member of it anymore. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's, I think that like continuing like a political education and continuing political work is something that I I can't not do. It's it's basically ingrained in my DNA at this that's point. That's how I feel. Um, as far as like learn what I learned from the uh, uh, run for mayor, I actually, so I gave a TED talk at Iowa State uh, in 2019 about my run for mayor and about uh, why young people should run for local office. And I think that was my biggest takeaway is that like, I was meeting so many people who were involved in politics who are around my age, like you, like 
uh, Tamara, like uh, 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 Johnny and um, like, and obviously like other leaders who had been like established there longer, like uh, that's actually when I met Carl and when I met yeah. uh, uh, Tom just, Willett. I mean, the, Jan Wan. Who's yeah. an absolute Jan Wan is a community fucking treasure, man. I love her. <laughs> I I can't think of his name. Who's he always runs for office, but he never wins. What's oh, his name? Max Max Weaver. Max Weaver. Yes. yes. We, uh, and you. for the viewers and subscribers, we actually interviewed him. Max Weaver is a very eccentric man who is in every city council meeting, going hard, you know, definitely a man driven he by cares. his own. He definitely he does cares care. about the community. He does. And I don't agree with him on everything, but yeah. he, he's awesome. So if you guys want to check out that interview, we had a good discussion about how to invest in uh, like um, small communities, like what's actually good for a small community and stuff. But yeah, man. Um, it, it's funny. Like I think there's a certain vein in people. Like you said, it's in your DNA. And I don't, I don't know how your childhood was or like what, was the the thing that made you realize like oh this is who i am a polit i am a political creature but i think it, it's something you're it's something you're born with and you know there's a lot of cynicism right now and defeatism after you know the two bernie campaigns being you know essentially cucked let's you yeah. know <laughs> for lack of a better word and um and the the failures that we are seeing of of the progressive movement right now failure to deliver uh, some divisiveness, you know, there's a lot of cynicism and in, in even like my co-host Johnny's very much is like, man, I just want to get a plot of land and like raise some goats or some shit. I'm <laughs> sick of this, you know, I feel like um, but I tell him all the time. I'm like, you know, I'm like, you're not going to do that because it's in you. You, you don't ever, it's, you, you don't, you can't, you want to give up. You want to just like fucking have your gin and tonics in the afternoon and, and never watch the news again. But like it's in here and it, you know, you take a step back for a while, but you always, you hear the one story, whatever that story exactly. is, you're like, fuck, I got to get back into this, you know? Or so. you just, you see somebody and it like, it just it comes back out or you hear an argument and you're like, oh, I, I can't let that sit Listen there. here, <laughs> motherfuckers. Let me yeah. tell you about Karl Marx. And then he just start, and then uh, you're back into throw it. throw capital at them. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yep. So, uh, getting on, on, you say you're part of the, what is it again? The IMT you say, mm -hmm. what yeah. was the, what was that acronym for again? The international Marxist tendency. Okay. Uh, they do some work with the labor party in the UK and with mm -hmm. DSA here in the United States as well. They ever um, work with like socialist art alternative as well. I, I'm I haven't, I do know them mm -hmm. though. Um, yeah. I want, I want to get involved with, uh, the DSA, but yeah. I haven't really had like a great opportunity yet. There's a YDSA as part of Ames, but it only got yeah. started at the very end of um, uh, the semester when COVID began, yes. and they really started to shut things down. So I never really got to join any of their meetings or, or do any organizing with them, which is sad. But Yeah, we tried to get a chapter of the DSA off the ground here in North Iowa, and it's still something I believe will happen in the future. But um, are you familiar with Conrad Boscom? He worked with the Bernie campaign uh, in 2016, 2020, but he was after the Bernie campaign, he was trying to get a, a chapter off the ground um, and he was trying to get us organized. Um, and it was me, him, Jan Juan, and uh, a comrade of mine, John Erkson, trying to get it off the ground. But then Conrad ended up having to move and I'm stretched so fucking thin as it is that I, I just, I couldn't. And, but I am hoping someone and people keep telling me it's got to be me and i'm like guys i <laughs> i have to like have a life i have a girlfriend and a daughter i can't like you know be taking on capital at all moments of the day as much as i'd like to but so that kind of um kind of fell through but i don't know do you think like a, a, as your future as an activist like where do you think the future lies with that like is there a particular organization or do you have any thoughts on that we live in like such turbulent times that like i have no idea yeah um i think i'm gonna be with the imt for a look for at least a while i i like uh the people who i've met in the organization and i uh 
I do a lot of stuff. And I do want to get involved with the DSA, like, relatively soon. I think, like, um, especially as, uh, uh, oh, what's the word? Especially as, like, this recession and this pandemic continue to get, like, worse, um, which I think that they're only going to get. Uh, yes. I don't think Biden's going to do much. Yeah, I don't. It's going to be austerity. Hey, 10K in student debt, okay? That's done, okay? Not 50K like was initially planned. Or is all he, of it. Like, was is planned. he still going to cancel some student loan debt? I haven't followed up on that. The last I saw was that he was very much like, I'm going to, I think he, his quote was, I'm going to take some, some ball out for this, but dot, dot, dot. Yeah, so I, I heard, a, I think I heard what you also heard. Is, is there, it sounded like you're signal, uh, saying that maybe he was signaling that some of it might be canceled? I recently read that he was on board with 10K, mm. um, which is significantly lower than the initial proposals, which were like 50K, mm -hmm. um, which I think is why those were the initial proposals. Uh, yeah. And so I think, I think he wants to do 10K. I don't know when that would happen. I don't think that's a day one ticket for Definitely him. Definitely not. Uh, yeah. I don't know what a day one ticket for him is, to be honest, because every time one, I see... The day one ahead. ticket for him is to pass harsh, quote-unquote, domestic terrorism legislation. That will, <laughs> yeah. Is what I I've do, seen. Like, isn't that Biden's specialty? Yeah. <laughs> the, the 1994 thing. crime bill? The yes. Patriot Act? You know what? That's a good little segue. Okay. Um, lots been going on in current events. Uh, the events of 1-6 at, at the Capitol... Trump is banned from like God all social media. I had a real laugh to see that he was even banned from Pinterest. I did not know that. That's and I was joking with my girlfriend. I was like, so imagine like we don't know this side about Trump and he's been banned from all the social media and he's really stressed and upset. And something we don't know about Trump is that in his personal life to come down from the stress of the presidency and being a complete dirtbag, he likes to go on Pinterest and like do arts and crafts or like make a homemade recipe for his family. It's something we don't know about Trump, a little more intimate side of Trump. And he goes to log into his Pinterest account to like make an enchilada recipe for his family. And he can't get on Pinterest even. And just <laughs> imagining he's like, what? You know? Um, but do you have any thoughts? This is a real point of contention. Uh, I mean, freedom of speech in the American paradigm uh, or in the American lexicon is, is um, you know, it's always, it's a back and forth, you know, we always are having a discussion about it. It's, just, it's integral to our society, but Trump being banned from all of social media, essentially a digital execution. And we're even seeing some division on the left about it. You know, I'm saying people on the left, like real leftists, like Marxists being like, this is good. This is bad. Here's why. So he's, he's had this digital execution. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, do you think yeah. it's good that he was banned? Do you, do you think that it sets a precedent that may be negative for the future? So I think I want to tackle this from both sides, right? Because I, I agree with both sides, actually. Yes. Um, I, I know their arguments very well. Like the, the Marxists that say it's a good thing that he's banned say we're silencing someone who has uh, – who is – not necessarily a fascist, but is on the road to fascism and dances with fascism and uses Close enough fascism. without your eyes getting wet. Uh, and the Marxists who say, well, we can't support this uh, because it's uh, going to be used against us as a tactic for censoring the left. And they're both right, right? Like Donald yeah. Trump, I'm okay. I'm not going to shed a tear for Donald Trump being censored. I want him to be censored. I think he should be censored. Uh, I'm glad that he's being censored because he was inciting reactionary violence. Oh, yeah. And that's the thing that we should be opposed to. But yes. at the same time, I, I don't want these tactics to be used against leftists, uh, obviously because I'm a hypocrite, but also because... Uh, well, even conservative, like even traditional conservative voices. Did you hear that Ron Paul recently had his Facebook page banned? I did not hear that. Uh, yeah, that that, that Ron, actually does surprise me quite a bit. That Ron yeah, Paul. It, well, because he was calling out big tech about the yeah. censorship of this and there and and i think therein lies the crux of the issue is not even just leftist or right-wing uh thought processes it's it's dissent in general against big tech 
you know, uh, Facebook shouldn't be able to own Instagram and five other social media companies. Why does Google have this control? Why don't we have like more of a diversification of search engines, uh, the selling of private information, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, people are failing to understand that like, yes, Trump being banned is probably a good thing. But they're going to use this to censor voices that are going to, you know, raise concerns about their conglomeration and, and monopolization, you know? Yeah. And uh, like 110%. They're, they're, they're going to use this to, uh, you know, uh, better their own brand. Like they're, they're just going to they're going to strip away the, the voices that uh shit on them like like you said and we can notice that trump has been one of those voices that is like critical of big tech if only because they like disagree with him yes. uh, on liberalism neoliberalism versus neo-fascism uh but like that that's the thing uh like th they're going after the voices that are uh, uh that are critiquing them and i i didn't even know about ron paul i didn't yeah, I, I found that out like the other day and I was like, That's you know, city. you see, and, and, and this is the thing, like, why is this, why this shouldn't be as divisive as an issue as it is. Uh, Trump should, should be banned because he incited violence. He, he, he's in look, Biden lies a lot too. Obama a lied a lot too. Big facts. But the degree to which Trump has like brazenly lied, like it's not even double speak lies. It's just like yeah. <laughs> lies, you know? Um, but, and, and then the inciting of, of the violence and, you know, I mean, I wish I had like a, a list prepared of, of some of the things that he said, like when the looting starts, the shooting starts that alone. It's like, yeah. if any one of like, I've, I've, almost lost control of our entitled millennials facebook page because i posted something that had a swastika on it like saying like negative things about fascism nazism but the algorithm didn't pick up on that and yet you have this guy that has this immense amount of power how many millions of followers saying things like when the looting starts the shooting starts the, the, the reality is he should have been banned a long time ago but of course Absolutely. it was it, it was, was this, he was literally going. like bringing like violence into the streets like he wasn't even just saying it he was sending out like squads to go take people in in the night in portland yes, yes. Uh, he was like not just instigate he was not just calling for violence he was literally instigating it yep yeah like and no one cared or at least none of these tech companies cared because it wasn't uh, uh it was something that he could legally do through um uh, uh, uh through the patriot act yes it's, it's, yeah, it's and I think we're going to see an extension of the Patriot Act uh, in regards to domestic terrorism, and that's terrifying to me. Because how long is it? Because, you know, you set this precedent under somebody that's left, like Biden, which obviously, as we know, he <laughs> isn't actually left. No. But in the, in the official channels left you know a, a quote-unquote good president, you give them this, this power or you give this power to um, big tech – and then let's say 10 years from now, we have an administration that's worse than Trump. And because of maybe a changing political dialogue within big tech companies, they become more pseudo fascist rather than, you know, quote unquote liberal. Then well, what? Then what? I think like to an extent, like they kind of are because as much as they're attacking like conservatives that have spoken out against, um, uh, uh, you know, big tech, they are also very pro, like the, the algorithms are very pro conservatives that don't like Prager U, which is like, they use YouTube uh, to, to, to that, that's how they market their brand. That's how they get yes. minds. Yes. Um, I know that there was something called like the Puda, the PewDiePie pipeline where mm. it would essentially take people who watched PewDiePie and like, the recommendeds would have like alt-right content in it. No shit. And it was like, it was a, a, a bit more of an elaborate process, but like, it was like based on like the words that were said in like the videos and uh, it is it, very complex, but essentially it, it's, it's a pipeline to take like 
one section of entertainment and turn it into uh, like ideological, uh, you know, uh, ideological like framing for mm. a person's worldview. And um, actually, have you seen that there's a documentary on Netflix? The Social um, Dilemma? Social Dilemma. And they talk a lot about this. I haven't seen it, but I watched a Joe Rogan interview with the guy that like created it. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, and you know, you could be conspira conspiracy minded, okay, and maybe there's some truth to this, but you could be like, you know, big tech and, and the government and the giant corporations are all in bed together and they're purposely, purposely fostering division in order to like bring America to its knees, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe there's a grain of truth to that. I don't necessarily think that there isn't, but there doesn't need to be this giant conspiracy of that and like Bilderberg and fucking et cetera. It's enough. Like in the social dilemma, they talk about this is profitable. Divisiveness is profitable because it, keeps people invested you know you can watch a cat video you can watch a cat vi cat videos for 45 minutes oh that's really good for the algorithm that's good for advertisers people are seeing advertisers more but as we all know when you're getting in an argument on the internet over a divisive issue you might be on that motherfucker all day all day long because you're coming back because somebody calls you a fucker and you're like no fuck you and it just like keeps going and so then instead of what, seeing 10 ads today, you saw 150 because every time you opened up, you know, or you're just spending more time on there so you're not going on another social media platform that's not using a, single, a similar algorithmic process to keep your attention, you know? And uh, it's crazy that Social Dilemma documentary really lays it out how this shit is bringing America to its knees. It's it's the, the divisiveness and the radicalization and uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's insanity, man. And it's very not Orwellian, but for lack of a better word, it's just sometimes I take a step back and I look at the times we're living in and I'm like, is this a fucking simulation? Like, is this actually real? Like Donald Trump being the president and our, our most recent episode of our podcast was the QA non shaman saves America. And they put a fucking, I'll see if I can pull it up. Um, they put a fact check on our video. Um, a fact check. They put a fact check on our video about QAnon. See if I can find it on here. Um, yes, right here. So because of because it had QAnon in the title, I don't know if you'll be able to see this or not, but I'll pull it up here. I don't know if you can see the little Wikipedia QAnon. It's backwards on the I screen. Can, I, I can see it, but I can't. Okay, so, so it says... Uh, it's a, a link to Wikipedia and it says QAnon is a disproven and discredited far right conspiracy theory alleging that a cabal of Satan worshiping cannibalistic pedophiles dot dot dot. And I, I saw that and I was like, what the fuck timeline am I living in that there's a note on my YouTube video talking about a cabal of Satan worshiping cannibal pedophiles. I, you know, and I just look at all of it and I look at these like algorithms literally like controlling the way that our processes work and <laughs> the growth of giant firms. And I, I, I'm just like, holy shit, like I am, we are all living in a dystopic future novel that not even the greatest minds like Orwell or um, uh, but I'm th uh, the guy who wrote Brave New World could have even imagined. <laughs> And yeah. Johnny always jokes with me that he's like, I swear to God, these people that run our society, they read the, those novels and they're like, hey, that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> let's, yeah, let's... Maybe that, you know, <laughs> yeah. I never thought of it like that. Yeah. Johnny's always throwing uh, crazy little curveballs at me like that. But um, yeah, it's just, it's wild times that we're living in and I don't know. Do you have do you have any thoughts on that? On the state of the world, like a broad statement, or like how it makes you feel emotionally or spiritually? Oh god! I know it's kind I, of a broad toss well, there, but no. I mean, like, I have too many takes on the world. Right? There's so much happening. Like, so in in 2019, like I was like really hopeful, right? Like I had there was so much happening. Like I think I, I saw that Haiti had like was going through like a revolutionary moment. There were, there were things happening in, in Chile, Hong uh, Kong, Hong Kong uh, and then like 2020 hits. And then like 
things start happening here. And then the Black Lives Matter protests like happen and I got like super involved with that. I was, uh, our, the marches were incredible. They filled me with such hope and then yes. nothing. And then Joe Biden. And then like now there's still things to be hopeful about like the 250 million person strike that happened in India. Yes. But then there's also things to be like horribly depressed about like uh, the fact that we're entering a recession and we don't have like an effective, uh, like coordinated leftist, like anything. We have like just a bunch of like tendencies that it's not like it was in the sixties, you know, yeah. the solidarity is no, not there in America not. at least. And why? Well, so I actually think that this has a lot to do uh, with Nixon. Hmm. Um, so, uh, I kind of, I, I really like to focus on like reactionaryism sure. and like how it develops. Um, and I think in the seventies and eighties during the farm crisis, do you know about the farm crisis? Um, fill me in a bit. So the farm crisis, um, was an event that basically took the, the rural like heartlands of America and transformed them from being, uh, bastions of like middle class farmers into the industrial farms that we have today. Okay, yes. I am a bit familiar from yeah. the whole press it's thing. I learned some of that, yes. Yeah, exactly. That that that's like a and it doesn't get taught to us in Iowa. It's almost like it's almost like a continuation of what happened during the Dust Bowl. You know what I'm saying? Like it's like yeah. that same vein of uh monopolization occurring. But yes, go on. Well um like at that same time um, this is like at the beginning of like the Keynesian uh, like fall, like when Keynesianism kind of came to an end and neoliberalism was being installed. Was Keynesianism is an economic philosophy regarding, and you can correct me on this, but it has something to do with. Uh, I'm terrible at this. You're you're more of the scholar than I am, but it's about like the way that the government spends money. Yeah, basically. right. And like you can spend money almost essentially indefinitely and it will spur economic growth. I mean, essentially, I, yeah. yeah. No, no, you're, 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 you're pretty much like hit the nail on the head. Like okay. it's, it's basically what, what, um, like, uh, uh, FDR was like the original Keynesian and then sure. it was continued under people like Eisenhower and, and, uh, JFK and even Nixon for a little bit, but like it, things really started to come to an end. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with the culture wars that developed out of uh, the 1968 presidential campaign. Mm. Uh, that was a very chaotic time. Uh, you know, there was Bobby Kennedy who got assassinated. There was uh, everybody. MLK who <laughs> everybody got assassinated. Got killed. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. And Cointel like, pro that's a discussion for another time though. <laughs> What, so what, what Nixon does is he comes in with this campaign, um, you know, focused on, it's called the Southern strategy. I'm sure you've heard of it. I'm sure lots of people have. Yeah. Uh, well, this Southern strategy was about dividing people on cultural issues as opposed to class-based ones. Oh. And it was very effective. Yes. Um, you know, we talk about like the racist like aspects of it, like the tough on crime stuff, school busing and the war on drugs, but like things like abortion, uh, became big issues because Damn, as part of this like shift, um, uh, uh, as part of the shift, they built bridges between like corporatists ideal, uh, ideal ideology and um, uh, uh, religious extremism, which is why you can see things like, uh, you know, big business men supporting, um, uh, you know, like the, the religious, aspects of the right and and right. vice versa that that tie between corporatism and like evangelicalism and and things of that nature yes exactly you're kind of fucking me up right now with this because like i i've i've always understood that they use these issues for, uh to divide us so that we don't look at each other as working class people being fucked but you know i hate the black guy because he took the job or the mexican guy and etc but I guess I didn't realize that it had this like very um, deliberate beginning. Yeah. You know? So yeah, go yeah. on though. Go on. Though. I don't mean to interrupt you. That's just fascinating. No, no, no. I, I mean, it's a discussion. Yeah. Uh, 
so I, well, I think like where we're at today, like with Trumpism is it's, it's, it takes a lot of like those cultural like ideas and then dials them to 10. Right. And it does so using say that again, dials them to what? To 10. Like it just, it Uh, takes everything that, that Nixon was doing and then like increases it a hundred percent. He's like, he's still when he, cause there's this like desire to be like subtle, Mm. but also overspoken, which is like, I think where like dog whistling comes from. Right. Like they want to say things, but they can't, but they still do. And Trump like has kind of like mastered this art. Yes. Uh, where I actually, I watched a video that kind of like deconstructs how he speaks. And it's, it's, it's very like smart and it's terrifying actually, because what he, he is does a con man, man. I mean, yeah, well, he's a trained salesman and yes. it shows it's he's terrifying. Ameri- I always tell people he's as American as apple pie. He's just the ugly <laughs> half of the pie. You're you know right. what I'm saying? <laughs> he is the ugly half of the pie. Yeah. Uh, well, he like, he puts like the power words, like the punching words at the very end. Um, and it's, it's very deliberate. And that's why sometimes his se- sentences sound weird because he's trying to give you an emotion at the very end of the sentence to, to really sell you on it. Yeah. And that stops you from thinking on it more. Yeah. Whereas if the emotional peaks were in the beginning or the end, and then you elaborate and it comes down, you have time to think about like, Oh, that sounds like bullshit. But like when you pop at the end and then you go into the next buildup, you're still, yeah, fuck you're yeah. You're still coasting, yeah. America, dog. And then like, and then, and then he pops it again. You're like, fuck, you know? And then you're just like, you're, you're on one at that point, you know? Yeah. And it, it like, it's just so, I don't understand how he can do that so effectively, but like the thing about like fascism um, is like it's a lot of it's about imagery. Mm. A lot of it's about uh, constructing like these uh, uh, ideals based around things like nationhood and based around things like uh, uh, faith, faith, and and um, yeah, those are the working two hard. Things. American dream is like the American dream is the most powerful tool or ideology of inundation ever because the idea of the American dream, like it don't matter what color you are or what you believe in religiously. It's this idea of like, if you come to America and you work hard, you can make it. And then it has, so it just appeals to everybody to wave the flag and and believe in the troops because it's defending this idea of like, you can make it if you work hard. And then it has this added benefit to the ruling class of if you aren't making it, if you're poor, if you're struggling, it's on you and not systemic issues. You know what I mean? So it's just one of the most powerful, I mean, it, it trumps nationalism, it trumps racism, it trumps religion, because it's also material. You can touch the fucking Cadillac. You can't touch Jesus, you know, on feet on the cross. You can you can get in that fucking nice Cadillac and ooh, it's that's a new. good way of it smells that. good, man. This is real, you know, and this is my religion, you know, the God of money, and it's like you know you can put hands on it, and it's powerful. It's powerful. Yeah, I've never thought of it like that. That's a that's a really good way of like describing it. Because you're right, like it does, it gives like a very tangible like thing, like to a belief system, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, bro. Wow. It fucks me up, and it's one of these things. Like, you know, George Carlin, they call it the American Dream. You have to be asleep to believe it you know and i i wrote a i, I wrote a piece actually a short or a novelette about my time at curry's called uh we called it the shithole and i talk about i go on this like you know stream of uninterrupted consciousness because it's a novel and i'm deep you know <laughs> and i go on this thing about like you, you get this job and then, and then you you get a wife and the kids and then you, you you're buying you buy the house and the car and but then suddenly the economy turns and you're working 10 hours 12 hours and now your wife hit hit, like doesn't you know your kids hate you because you never see them and your wife 
is fucking Rodriguez at the office because he's a Latin lover who tells her she's beautiful. And then suddenly you're divorced and in all this debt and your kids never speak to you and you're working 12 hours a day at this job and you're drunk all the time and you wake up one day in front of the mill and you realize you've been living the great American nightmare your whole life, you know, and uh, you know, just people don't, people don't see it that way. Cause that, that idea of the American dream is, is so, is so powerful, and, you know? Well, I see that too. in like a lot of people who read like Ayn Rand and like their philosophies, like they'll talk about like objectivism and how they have to look out for themselves. But like what they don't realize is that like your best bet, like uh, unless you're in that like top 1%, uh, maybe top 10, like 5 or 10%, but sure. I think mostly just... Uh, but, like, unless you're, like, way, like, at the top, you're you're better off under a, a society that, uh, you know, cares about you, that actually has, like, uh, that is socialist because you're a worker. You're not a, you're not a capitalist. But it also turns the people into those... Exactly. And it, and it also turns people into those temporary embarrassed millionaires, right? Yes. Like, that's the... Uh. And then, and then everyone's an enemy because that guy is no longer a ally or somebody to join hands with to fight for better conditions. He's competition. Mm -hmm. And if he gets it, I don't. And, and yeah, that's going again with that American dream ideology being so powerful. Is it, um, it, it beats class consciousness to death in its sleep. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's why we are where we're at, where we, and again, that's maybe a bit of a transition here. Why we are so fucked in this country is years of propaganda, not only about like socialism and communism, but just in general of the, that consumerist mentality and the fuck you, I got mine that it, it, it's, it's neutered, uh, it's nerfed class consciousness which is essential you have to have class consciousness you have to have a class consciousness functioning mind in order to to organize against the interests of the of the billionaire class for your own uh, but if you if you think that every working person is potential competition rather than uh somebody right. to hold shields with then you're you're never going to do it you know yeah um, and I'm sorry if we kind of took a, a, a tangent there. That's how podcasting goes a little bit. You go on <laughs> trying to talk about, you know, we started talking about reactionary uh, politics and, and it kind of diverges a little bit. But going off that last point, you know, with the rise of Bernie Sanders, we began to see a uh, IV drip, if you would, of class consciousness, just a little bit at a time. And, um, you know, this organization effort underneath the Democratic Party, we can reform the Democratic Party, uh, the rise of progressive candidates like AOC and the squad. And now we're coming to this point, like with the whole uh, the whole clash with like Jimmy Dore and AOC with the hashtag force to vote movement. Um, we're seeing to a not a complete failure of progressivism. But we're seeing somewhat of a of failure, some failures of progressivism within the Democratic Party. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, we we are seeing the building of some power within the party, you could argue. But is it enough? Does the future actually lie in the Democratic Party? Do we need a third party? Do we need some combination of both? Do you have any thoughts on that? So, well, first I want to say that I actually, I worked on the Bernie campaign this last election cycle um, and at, in, in 2016 and again in 2020, I was my respective caucus chair for Bernie because uh, I really did believe that he was the best shot that the left had. But yes. following the uh, following like March around of this year, I became a lot more radical in my in my politics. I don't think Same. that after like after spending so much time like within the Democratic Party, I really just don't think that the infrastructure is there for it to be reformed into a progressive working people's party. Yes. I don't think it can be. I, I, I love that we have like voices that are using it like AOC and Ilhan Omar, even if I don't agree with them hundred percent of the time. About how uh, they plan on getting it done. Yeah, exactly. Especially about that. I don't think that you can reform those parties to, to that extent, but I'm glad that they have 
voices, I guess, that that they're able to use in, in politics. But like you've said, they've done a lot of, they've had a lot of failures. You know, they've, uh, AOC, I know, has voted for a few war budgets. Um, yes, very disappointing. Uh, and like, obviously, with, um, they never forced the vote on Medicare for All, which is a very divisive issue also in the left for various yes. issues. What um, are your, a little side tale here, what are your thoughts on that? I think that you could force the vote. I understand that the reason why they didn't do it before um, before the Georgia runoffs was because they would not have voted in favor of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would have it would have failed, and that would have hurt Democrats. Uh, but I mean, to be honest, Democrats also could have just all voted for it if they wanted to, knowing that Mitch McConnell would never pass it. So yes. I don't understand why they didn't just go for a a cheap win. But yeah, it's kind of a flag waving thing in my. Yeah. in my opinion like yeah it might fail but why wouldn't you just do it anyway yeah. you know but anyway go on with what you're saying i just want to do a little interlude interlude there um as far as like the democratic party and yeah. can it be reformed and so like i get like the answer to like that is i don't think so no i don't the democratic party um is one of the two parties that uh may, actually i have a book here who rules america uh, this is uh, a book that I had to read for my power politics and society course. Um, and it's like, it's a scientific analysis of uh, how the shit gets done here. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, I, I, there's a lot of stuff that comes up in this book that has come up in other stuff. Uh, do you know what ALEC is? The American Legislative Exchange Council? I have heard of it, but I'm not uh, versed in what they actually do and what they stand for. Not. So what the, they basically uh, write cookie cutter legislation and um, they take that legislation to state governments and the state governments pass it. And members of both parties are uh, part of the American Legislative Exchange Council. Actually, uh, Linda Upmeyer, who was Iowa's uh, uh, speaker of the yes. House, she was on the board of the American Legislative Exchange Council. She had okay. actually like a, a position in leadership. Yeah. Um, and I think she still does. I only found that out recently. Um, but uh, like the Democratic Party is like a, like they, they work with the American Legislative Exchange Council. They work with uh, uh, the pharmaceutical industries. They work with uh, ev- ev- like big tech. They work with uh, everybody. There, there's, there's like, th- there's no way that you can say that uh, that the Democratic Party isn't a capitalist party. It, it's it's not a working people's party. They have coalitions with unions, but it. I mean, the union movement in the United States is incredibly weak right now. We need to build much more unions and much stronger unions. Which is difficult in in a atmosphere of uh, automation and sh- shipping jobs overseas <laughs> and free trade. Oh, yeah. It's, it's damn near impossible. I would say it probably is impossible to do stuff like that. I would say that the best bet for unionization is in the service industry because you can't outsource services. You got to have waiters. You got to have fast food workers and people that help you with your cell phone and and whatever. Uh, but for whatever reason, we're starting to see it, but it's infantile right now. So, Yeah, but I mean – I, I've seen that there have been like some strikes organized in the United States as well, but like it, it's just hard without like concrete political demands and like a cohesive like working body to to get that change done. And I don't think that that body can be the Democratic Party. I don't think that they have the uh, they don't they don't have the desire to. They don't, they they're a capitalist party. They want the maintenance of capitalism. They're they're in my opinion better than the Republican Party in that they're not as aggressively like homophobic or racist or sexist. But they still support things like that. During yeah. Black Lives Matter protests, right? Democratic mayors would go out and say Black Lives Matter during the day, and then at night they would send out police forces to go and beat the protesters. That's exactly. not a, you can look that up. Like it's 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 horrific. And it is. like they they do double speak on like everything. Like Joe Biden during the primaries was actually pro uh, getting rid of fracking, but now he's not. Like that changed, uh, yep. and you and people don't care or they don't, but they they don't, they won't look into it more and they won't know because uh, the human attention span is short 
and, and you know, it's enough for people to have a guy not saying that black people suck and that it's okay to be gay. Yeah, and, you know. Here's the, and here's the thing: like, like on on issues that they say that they care about, like a lot, like for example, the ICE detention centers. Yes. Right. Liberal liberals will talk about how they how they care about uh, what's happening to the kids, but. Uh, Biden said, you know, Biden's administration isn't going to do anything about it for at, for a very long time. And they've said that they've said this is not like the biggest issue right now. We're going to hold off on this. Well, to like those kids being yeah, away from their it's, mothers, it's a pretty damn big issue. Yes. Like and it's not exactly like you couldn't have this legislation worked out. You know how governance works. You could re you could pre write some of these executive orders. Dude, yeah, something like that. Executive order. You could do that. Like if it were FDR or Bernie. The moment he sat in the big chair, it would be done. Yeah. Well, because, Bernie said he had like a bunch of day one executive orders. Yes, I know. I know. And people are always uh, afraid of imperial decree, but they use imperial decree anyway, but it's for murdering brown people overseas and fucking subsidizing corporations. And it's like, let's fucking, the emperor is already the emperor, the princeps first citizen. And it's like that, that, um, you know, hurdle was jumped a long time ago about ruling by imperial decree it's just a matter of in what way you know and yeah and another thing with the the kids in cages is well democrats don't want to actually act on it no matter how many moral quandaries they have with it because it's ran uh in large part by for-profit imprisonment and there's a lot of money in that for their from their lobbyists you know they make a check off them kids being in cages brother so what are they going to do? Shut them down? No. It's just how it is, man. So, yeah, that's just another issue of, like, even, you're right, like, even on the liberal, woke PC culture issues, they're full of shit. And I wish, and that's a big issue here, is we have, you know, people on the left, I guess, such a fucking loose term anymore, uh, that are in, so preoccupied with social issues, um, you know, gay rights, trans rights, um, you know, racism and, and whatever. And these are important issues. And I've taken people have come at me trying to say, I'm trying to downplay them. It's like, no, no, like I'm not, but they put so much energy into these things. You know, they're upset about somebody, you know, turfs misgendering somebody. But then when I post an image of all the catastrophe in, in blood, blood running like a river down the streets of fucking uh, Damascus in Syria. It's crickets. You know, and I, and I just don't understand it. And then I wish I could make them understand that if you care about these issues, it's all intertwined. The working class issues and, and the minority issues. And the Democrats aren't going to do anything about the, the, um, the social justice issues either. Because it does, they don't stand to make a profit off of it. And, and racism and bigotry and transphobia it's all rooted in a capitalist system that profits off of people being divisive that profits off of working class people seeing another group as less than there's actually and, like a, a very rich history of that too like in the united states uh yes. following um following the civil war uh, there was a, a an alliance between poor white farmers and recently freed uh, uh, black people. Really? And, yeah, there was an alliance in, in several areas of the South, but this alliance was disrupted the moment that the planters uh, regained their capital and were uh, able to uh, reassert themselves as the uh, dominant class of, of the South. Mm. Um, and so like, what, people will often say that you're being reductionist, right? But yeah. at, at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out why it's actually happening so that way you can stop like the terrible injustices. Yes. Right. Like I, so um, I, I wrote an essay on, on like the history of the American state as um, a violent institution against black people. Um, and it's been that way because of uh, obviously our origins as um, a slave holding society. But like, even after that, it, it continued to, to divide people up along those issues because it was uh, uh, economically convenient because it was, it was good uh, economics for the people at the top of society. And that's what people don't realize, is that if you want to create social change, um, you have to recognize 
that there's a, there's a very small group of people that have way more power than you that are doing lots of things and you have to be able to recognize what that power is. And the, the easiest way for you to see power in our society today is wealth. You can, yep. see, you can see a number and that can denote to you uh, effectively how many times more powerful they are than you. Yes. <laughs> I like to think. Yes. Jeff Bezos it, can do anything, basically, in the world. Uh, yes. Musk. Well, he owns supply chains. Owns them. So if he wanted to, like, and this is stretching maybe, but if he wanted to be emperor of the United States, he could probably make it happen if he played his cards right. You know what I'm saying? Like, he has that much power where he could pollute the political system and and shut down supply lines and do all these different things, especially as he continues to expand into other mediums like entertainment, uh, broadcasting. Space. And space, motherfucker. <laughs> space. This guy is after it all. Have and he's going to fucking – he's probably doing shit with like – CRISPR and like cybernetics and prosthetics to where eventually he'll be like like fucking Darth Vader like and I'm I'm being you know caricaturesque here but I mean like you know this is what this motherfucker is on the inside he ain't fucking human I swear to god look at the look in his eyes man that ain't a human being you know like (laughs) have you have you heard the Lex Luthor quote um do you know how much power I would have to give up to be president that's how I. Oh, that's, that's what I hear every time. Like I. Oh. I, like, you just fucked me up with that. These guys have like, because here's the thing: they don't have the scrutiny that that like Trump or Biden or all of them do. Like oh, we, yeah. we get like an article about Jeff Bezos like once every like like two weeks, and it's some like fluff piece about like how he makes three decisions a day or how um, <laughs> how he's investing in space because that's all he can spend his money on anymore or stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, because like he has like he's doing all the all, like tons of shit like all the time that just doesn't get talked about he's making yeah. decisions that affect literally like millions of people billions yes. of people yes uh, uh, yeah it's it, and it's fundamentally undemocratic it's very hierarchical it's very uh, uh very rooted in in um uh an oppressive structure yeah. And it's 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 just objectively not something you should want for your society. <laughs> yeah, capitalism and democracy don't mix. No. It's it's not possible. Well, and that's another thing. People say that we live in a democracy so fucking often and it pisses me off. So no. I used to say that too. We no. live in a republic that has democratic elements and that's a yes. bad thing. We should yes. live in a democracy. We should yes. live in a, a society where people participate in their governance and it's like, And in their workplace. Because you can yeah, and their and their workplace because power is diffused because you should want power diffusion. You should not want power consolidation. That's the dumbest yes. thing on the planet. We should live in a democracy with elements of a republic. Yes. Where, yes. Like we're yes. honestly, I think that like we would need like tens of thousands of representatives. Yeah. Like, and they would need like they would need to be very small like localities. Yes. Like even neighborhoods. Like, and we could we could do it in in a. Uh, do you know how Iowa does their, uh, I, I don't want to say gerrymandering, but it's still gerrymandering. Do you know how Iowa cuts their districts? Um, I, I mean, I've seen, I've seen the maps, yes, but I'm not sure how that process works, no. So Iowa uses um, a, a, I think it's an algorithm that was developed by a bipartisan committee to do it. Okay. Um, or it might be nonpartisan. I think it's bipartisan, though. Yeah. Um, but you know. they use. Apples uh, and oranges. Yeah. Uh, and that's why our districts look so like like clean, right? And Compared it, to like some of them, yes. It doesn't hurt that Iowa also doesn't have any like major population centers, so we don't have to chop up like a city, for example. Like Whereas, even like, Des Moines is like pretty r- r- rinky dink in comparison to like. Oh yeah. It's funny, like in Des Moines, you can be like downtown, and then ten minutes later, it's like you're in a cornfield. But it, yet, it's like this <laughs> metropolitan-looking area. It's like a facade, yeah. and then you're like, here's a cow, like around the corner. It's great. Yeah. I love Des Moines. <laughs> it is a good town, man. It really mm-hmm. is. Um, but yeah, it, you know, going back to the 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 thing with like Jeff Bezos and, and the capitalist class and Johnny, Johnny, I love Johnny, man. I uh, he's so intelligent and intuitive. 
like you're really well read and, and that's and that's awesome and i appreciate that but johnny has this like intuition with stuff like he don't even he just like sees something and he's like i i don't know he, he just always drops bombs on me and one of the bombs he, you know and you've seen him on the show he's like he's like oh fuck and they say this but they're fucking you know how he is he's this mad irish fuck on the inside right and uh he he went on this rant one time he's like oh and they say how jeff bezos is the richest person in the world and that's fucking stupid that's just the richest person they're showing you there's people that own so much more wealth than him they that's he's true. just and and i and i elaborated i'm like yeah you're right like this is the richest ceo but who I mean, you could you the investors about- you don't know nothing about the guy who's invested in all the companies you know you i mean you could also like like you can even point to uh, uh families that like diffuse their wealth in between because you don't always hear like how many people know like the individual waltons i don't i know the family but exactly i don't like i don't i don't what think do that most americans know who own walmart <laughs> yeah or you uh, hear about like a samsung heiress that like yeah. You know, you'll once in a while hear about, or like, dude, I think I read somewhere, and I might be wrong about which family it is, but it was this Renaissance family. I think it's the Medici's, the Medici's that oh. were like in, in in Milan and shit, and yeah. they like built their power structure then uh, along trade routes with the 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 Silk Road, and that's and their political dynasty. It's like it, I might be wrong about that specific family, but there's many families in the Renaissance that compounded their wealth. Uh, during that time period because of trade with the East. And, and the Medicis or some family from that time period is still one of the richest families on in human history, and they own all this fucking shit. And you'll never know because it's it's just through subsidiary of subsidiary of LLC of fucking whatever because they own pieces of shit, you know? And, and that's a reality. Well, yeah. There's families that have been around 500 years that are... Why? How? How is that allowed? You know, and then you start thinking about, yeah, and I'm not advocating for violence, but are we, you know, wrong with the guillotine? There might be some. <laughs> People you know, have been. Using, I like that. I like that. That's making a comeback as a sign of political uh, uh, protest. Yeah. You know, I read this interesting thing about how the right, the right wingers will use the noose as a symbol of, you know. Protest, uh, protest, like, like. and how the left will use a symbol of the guillotine because the guillotine was generally reserved for ruling class, for the bourgeoisie that were a parasitic on society, and they chopped their heads off for it. Whereas the right wingers use a uh, um, a noose because it was a symbol of the pe- how you execute the peasant class. And I saw that I'm like, oh shit, that's kind of like it just shows that paradigm of like the difference of thinking, you know. And yeah. as far as descent goes but um but yeah man uh we did a little over an hour here and um my dad will be home here pretty soon and he'll make a ruckus when he comes in most likely <laughs> so uh it's probably a good place to um to cut it off cut it off here so uh this was great man it's a good, good conversation i'm sorry if we um didn't make it to everything we want to talk about but we could do it again in the near future if you're down i think it oh, went really well so absolutely i'm always down for political conversation yeah, man, this is great. So, um, for our viewers or our listeners, is there any social media? You got Twitter, Instagram, uh, any pages, any projects you want to like put out there for people? Or yeah, so um, should I just like uh, state it or uh, yeah, go, ahead and, uh, go ahead and just give people your your links or your ads, and then I'll uh, you can um, send them to me, send me links and shit, and I'll. I'll have them pop up here and I'll put them in the description box too. So people can check you out if they want. So you want me to send them to you then? Or should I mention? Yeah, send them to me, send them to me. And then also uh, just kind of list them off here too before we sign off. Uh, I guess my Twitter is uh, at Clex Alien. I don't really use a ton of social media to be honest. I have a TED talk. I'll, I'll list that, I guess. Yeah, sure. Uh, That one's about why young people should run for political office. If you're interested in that, uh, I think it's a really good topic. Some of my politics have changed a bit since then, but uh, most of the information is still good. Um, And uh, I have a medium piece that I wrote about uh, the history of America as a violent institution against black people. I believe I've sent that to you as well. Yep, yep. 
Yep. And you have like a link to go to medium for that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I think people would like reading that, man. I haven't had a chance to yet. Things have been kind of hectic as I told you about around here. So yeah, no worries. It's, uh, but yeah, man, do you have any closing statements, anything profound? I'm going to put you on the spot. Anything profound and, and deep and existential you want to leave our viewers with before we sign off here? Profound, deep, and existential. A message of hope, a message of cynicism, anything? <laughs> I, think, I think hope. I think hope's a good thing to have in these times. I think that as a society, we have a lot of potential to achieve great things. You know, I watched a video um, on Wisecrack over this guy uh, he's kind of crazy he thinks he's a wizard his name is uh, <laughs> uh i think i want to say it's grant morrison oh i i think it's the other one though there's two guys but basically uh, the video talks about how humanity has already achieved things that in another society we would call godlike you know we can send messages instantaneously we can we, which would be like hermes we can oh shit find anything uh, in the world using GPS, which is like an all seeing eye, you know, like omnipresence. We, we're an incredible set of biological machines. Uh, we have a very limited amount of time on the earth. I would just encourage everyone to recognize that and to be in awe really at what we can achieve when we work together. Yeah. You're a fucking poet, man. I love it. <laughs> That's great. I try. Well, all right, guys. Uh, I appreciate um, everybody coming in and, and, and listening and uh, getting to know Alex here a little bit, man. And it's It's been great. I look forward to talking to you again in the near future. All right, man? Absolutely. Good talking to you. Yeah, cool. Take it easy, buddy. You too. Bye.